All right. So thank you all for joining us today. My name is Liz. I am the Program and Outreach Specialist here at the Wood County Committee on Aging. And we are excited to have Lauren Broderick Stewart here. She's recently married. So uh, she is joining us um, from Maumee. She's at Maumee Bay State Park. And she is a naturalist with the Ohio uh, Department of Natural Resources. Thank you for joining us, Lauren. Absolutely. I'm very excited. I have a lot of animals to show you guys today. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So like Liz mentioned, my name is Lauren and I'm a naturalist here at Mommy Bay. Um, and naturalist is basically an informal educator. So I do some informal education for all age groups um, of visitors that come to the park. And we go places and people come to us as well. And mostly what we focus on is environmental education as well as some recreation. And so we're going to be on the environmental education side, and I'm going to show you some animals that are native to Northwest Ohio. We're super lucky at North, in Northwest Ohio, we have our own little unique ecosystem, and we also have some animals that are only found on this, in this part of the state. So I'm actually going to start with the furry ones. So I don't have any live mammals with me today, but I do have some pelts of and skins of animals that you might recognize and know what they are. And then we're gonna move on to the more creepy crawly. I know we're in October, getting closer to Halloween. So <laughs> we'll do the creepy crawly for the end. So this is one animal that's actually really common at Mommy Bay State Park. Um, believe it or not, a lot of times they're not seen very often. Um, they're known for their very, very soft fur. Uh, back in the day, people would make coats out of them. And this is actually a mink, an American mink. Uh, they are in the weasel family. They um, are very, very, very good predators. They're efficient predators, and they can eat things that are larger than themselves. So the mink are often found around water area, water systems, so lakes, rivers, streams, things like that. They like to eat frogs. They'll eat fish. They'll even eat animals as big as rabbits. They are very efficient hunters and can take down fairly large prey. Now, the mink has water-resistant fur. It's not completely waterproof, but it is water resistant. And that really makes sense, especially if you're living in areas that have a lot of water. Now, next, I'm gonna show you another animal that is tied to water. And that's kind of the theme here at Mommy Bay State Park because basically right to the north of us, the park ends it at Lake Erie. So we have a lot of water here. This animal was incredibly important for the first settlers in this region. So Mommy Bay State Park actually used to be part of the Great Black Swamp. Uh, this was a very hard and difficult region to live in. Um, as you, if you think of a swamp, it does not sound very like, not somewhere you're like, oh, I'm gonna go live in a swamp. It's, it's hard, it's smelly, it's wet. It's, it's really difficult to actually live there. And because of that, it was one of the last places in Ohio settled. Lake Erie used to be much, much, much larger. And as it, it ebbed and flowed, got bigger and smaller through the years, at one point, it, Lake Erie pretty much continued all the way to Fort Wayne, Indiana. So just imagine basically almost all of Northwest Ohio completely underwater. When it receded to what its current size of Lake Erie is today, it left a whole bunch of clay, clay soil. And that clay soil does not let water go through it very easily. So we get the swamp because of it. Now that clay soil has a ton of nutrients and actually does really, really well for agriculture. However, the problem is you have continuous and constant flooding. So until we were able to tile and to dig ditches in this region, it really wasn't successfully settled. But those that were very brave and adventurous did settle here um, in the, 18, the late 1800s is where we kind of picked up in terms of settlement, but before that, when it was sparsely populated, this animal is incredibly important. This is one of the largest rodents in North America. They can get up to 45 to 60 pounds, depending on where in North America you are. The farther north you go, the bigger they get. And this is very tied to water. Kind of hard to visualize it. It almost looks like a bath mat, but this is actually a beaver. And beavers were incredibly important. Their pelts were essentially currency up here because it is water resistant, which is really important here in Northwest Ohio and just in Ohio in general because 
it can, in the winter time especially, it snows and it's cold. So they have a water resistant pulp that is thick and insulating. So you get two for one essentially with this animal. And so this is really super duper important for the people who lived here because they were making their clothes out of this and able to survive. Uh, the Native Americans did not really hunt this region until the winter time because it was so hard to get through the muck and the swamp and just the ickiness that they waited essentially until it froze over so they could just walk on the ice. So think about that and think about how hard it would be to live here. You'd have to drain the swamp, cut down the trees, try to build a house essentially in a mud pit and go from there and try to find enough animal, uh, enough food to eat. Um, because of all the standing water, malaria was a very big problem here. And uh, many of people who first came over here from Europe actually ended up dying because of the diseases they caught here. And it was one of the last strongholds for the megafauna, so the larger animals that we have here in Ohio, such as the mountain lion, the wolves, and the bear, with some of them not being here anymore. So speaking, since we're on the theme of aquatic animals, here's another very important animal. I'm gonna stand back a little bit. This is a very large pelt. This right here is the relative of the mink. This is an American river otter. And they get very long and they are very, very social. Now, the river otter, again, like the beaver, has a water resistant pelt not quite as thick and as insulating as the beaver is, but very, very water resistant. This animal is a carnivore and it's going to eat fish, crayfish, and a big part of its diet is freshwater mussels. They used to be extremely common in the Maumee River. The Maumee River is a huge, huge river, part of the watershed of Lake Erie that used to support a lot of different aquatic life. But with the drainage of the swamp, we essentially lost a wetland filter. And with that, we got a lot of erosion and a lot of pollution, which really changed the quality of the water in the Maumee and eventually the quality of Lake Erie. And the mussels, the freshwater mussels, are filter feeders. So they're going through and they look kind of like clams. They, look like, they don't look quite, they're not as quite as exciting looking as clam, clams, but they do look like clams or oysters but they filter the water to get their food. And when the water is filled with tons of sediment and potentially pollution, that actually kills them off fairly quickly. And so we lost the river mussels and a good portion of the mommy or at least good populations of them. And with that, we saw a decline in our river otter up here. However, the mommy river has been designated a scenic river and we've seen a huge improvement of water quality, a huge improvement of aquatic life and we actually have our river otters back, which is awesome. And the river otters, like the mink, are in the weasel family. Now, this is another relative of the weasels that you all may know. It's a little bit, it's a dramatic one. It's very smelly. This is the eastern striped skunk. Now, skunks are actually one of my favorite, not my very, very favorite, the possum's my favorite, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But the skunks, um, have, they're actually fairly social. And they have just an incredible defense mechanism. If you smell very bad and you can make your potential predator smell bad, they'll leave you alone. And this, these markings are actually warning. Uh, instead of camouflage, they basically have warning coloration. A normal animal, like I'll give you an example of, let me see if I have a good counter shading. A normal animal is gonna have a darker top and a lighter bottom. Because when you think about it, when you're looking at something from above, it's gonna blend in more with the ground, so it needs to be that darker color. But when you're looking underneath something, you're looking at the sky, so it's gonna be that lighter color. The skunk goes with the opposite, because the skunk wants to be seen, because he's not worried about getting eaten, because he smells terrible and tastes bad. But the skunk doesn't immediately spray when it sees you. It's actually a lot of root work to produce that musk. So they try to hold off until it's last resort. And they'll actually go through a whole series of basically warning displays. So the first thing is the most typical that we see is it raises its tail. This is an extremely old pelt, so its tail is no longer as fluffy as it used to be, but they have a very, very fluffy tail and they shake it, warn it, and it looks big and it makes them look pretty big. If that doesn't work, I like to say they, they kind of throw a tantrum. They'll stomp their feet. They're trying to look big and intimidating. 
And if that doesn't work, they still have one more thing up their sleeve. They actually do handstands. And it's to make themselves look big. So it's really, especially um, when they're, the, their kids are young, they kind of practice their warning displays. They don't feel threatened, but they kind of play around. And you'll see baby stumps stand, doing handstands with their tails shaking, and they're just playing with each other. But it works really well because they're really saying, are you sure you want to try to bother eating me? It's not going to work out well for you. And they actually have two different types of sprays that they can do. They can do a misting spray or a water gun style spray. If you're farther than 15 feet away from them, they'll do the misting so it will drift to you and you'll smell bad and it'll taste bad. Now, if you're too close, the skunk will actually do the more targeted spray and they like to aim for the eyes. The skunk musk actually can cause temporary blindness besides the smelling bad. So it's a very, very effective defense mechanism. And there's actually only one natural predator of the skunk, and it is the great horned owl. So skunks are mostly nocturnal, and owls are nocturnal, so they're coming out at the same time. Owls actually have a terrible sense of smell. So nothing better to eat the skunk than something that has a bad sense of smell and is so quiet coming in that they can actually grab the skunk before the skunk can hear the owl coming. So here is the skunk. Now we'll move on to our larger animal. This one I'm very excited about because it's coming back in Northwest Ohio. I'm gonna move this back a little bit. It's also a very large pelt. This is one of the few members of the feline family that we have to represent us in Northwest Ohio. This is the bobcat. Now, a bobcat doesn't get its name because its full name is Robert Cat. It's actually Bobcat because it has a bob or shortened tail. They are more terrestrial. So they're going to be found more on the ground. They can climb trees, but they're going to prefer to hunt more on the ground. They are extremely secretive. They are rarely seen. Often you only really see them on trail cams rather than actually see them in person. And they can get up to 35 pounds. So this is not a house cat. This is a wild animal does not have any of the manners that house cats may have. I have two, mine have no manners, but they're not 35 pounds. So they are very good predators. They like to eat small mammals. So they're looking for squirrels. They're looking for rabbits. They like to eat birds, but for the most part, they're gonna leave and try to stay as far away from humans as possible. They are becoming increasingly common in Ohio. We have more habitat for them and less habitat fragmentation than their poor areas. And in Northwest Ohio, we actually had one unfortunately hit by a car, but it was able for us to confirm that they're here in 2015. And speaking of predators, here is a scrap of one of the more common predators that we'll see, um, especially here actually in the park. This is actually a coyote. So coyotes are increasingly common as we go farther east. Originally, they were only found in the western half of the United States. However, as wolves moved farther and farther north and were extirpated in uh, the northeast, coyotes kind of filled in that void. Coyotes aren't as social as wolves are. Um, they have actually adapted incredibly well to human interaction and human urbanization. There's um, a very neat documentary on coyotes. They actually had a coyote radio collar that lived essentially in downtown Chicago. So that's how well they can tolerate human presence. And she, it was a female that actually had a den on the side of a highway in a berm there. So it is just incredible how well they adapted. Um, coyotes, a lot of people think it's super duper huge. They actually max out about 40 pounds. So if you're looking at the medium sized dog, they're gonna be smaller than a German Shepherd for sure. But that does not mean that you always, you don't need to take caution when you see them. Um, they are still a wild animal. However, they're going to avoid you if at all possible. So there's our coyote. Coyotes are super opportunistic. They'll eat things ranging from fruit, scraps, trash, all the way through to actually catching prey such as rabbits, frogs, um, anything in between. So they're very opportunistic. And speaking of opportunistic, this is our most common visitor. 
Aha, here it is. Our most common visitor at Mommy Bay State Park and our most commonly seen mammal. The raccoon. Raccoons are incredibly smart. They're incredibly adaptive. They eat almost anything. I call them garbage disposals because they literally will eat garbage, but they'll eat almost anything. They deal with humans incredibly well. And unfortunately, there's a lot of human animal conflict with them. Uh, they get very habituated to people and they get, especially if people feed them and that can cause them to become aggressive. So, and if they're, we should be seen as potential predators. So they should be fleeing from us rather than approaching us. Raccoons unfortunately carry a whole bunch of diseases. They can carry ticks, which can cause Lyme disease. They actually can be infected with a parasite, a protozoan, that can cause blindness in humans. They carry distemper, which is harmful to our domestic dogs, as well as they can be potentially a carrier for rabies. So there's a lot of reasons why to leave wildlife wild and try to view it rather than interact with it. Because not only can it hurt us, it can actually hurt the raccoon itself. The raccoon needs to be feeding on the foods that are native to Ohio, not human food. Especially human junk food is terrible for our native animals. So that's always something to remember. To view wildlife, don't try to interact with it. Even though they may be, look so cute, especially when they're babies, they can cause tons of damage, be harmful to our health. Uh, we actually had a raccoon get into a camper that uh, someone that we know is one of their campers and caused the big motor home and caused almost $30,000 in damage looking, while it was looking for food because it ripped out a whole bunch of electrical stuff. So that's just something to consider. Um, if a toddler could open it, assume a raccoon can open it. They have it almost like an opposable thumb. If you ever see their paw prints, I call them creepy baby hands. They look like really weird baby hands but they actually are very dexterous and can open many things. So there's our raccoon. So we are gonna move on to our more lively animals. I have some native uh, reptiles and amphibians to show you. And today is also feeding day. So at the very end, I have some animals that will feed. Um, all, of the, all of the things that we feed our animals, um, I'll talk a little bit more about, but we don't do any live feedings unless they're insects. So. But first, we're going to start with our leopard frog. So the big thing about frogs is I always have to make sure I mention this. Frogs are um, environmental indicators. They have very sensitive skin. And they actually can absorb a lot of toxins in their skin. So that's the one, one, of, their, one of the first signs that we see issues with frogs is we have a water quality issue. If all of a sudden the frogs start to die. And they are one of the first impacted by that. Uh, frogs are very interesting. Their skin can actually absorb oxygen in the water. And so many of our frogs actually overwinter underwater. Everything is so cold, as long as they don't freeze, they're in, they're in the clear. Everything is so cold, cold, they require so little oxygen, that they get enough oxygen just from sitting in the water, essentially. So one of our first frogs I'm going to take out is actually a true frog. It's in the Rana genus. Um, it is a leopard frog. Leopard frogs are one of the most common frogs here at Mommy Bay State Park. Um, the frogs all have a mucus layer covering, a slime layer, that helps protect their skin from potential bacteria or fungal infections and also helps them facilitate getting oxygen from the water. But it also makes them really slippery. Because I have oils and dirt on my hands, I always make sure to get my hands wet before I pick them up. It helps protect the frog. Um, it does make them a little more slippery, but it's in the best interest of the frog. So let's see if I can catch it very gracefully. It might not be super graceful today. Ah, first try. So here is my leopard frog. So I'm actually not squeezing my leopard frog very hard. Believe it or not, I know he looks like he's Hugging it in as much as he can. My leopard frog has a really neat defense mechanism. One of their main uh, predators are snakes. So the snake can only eat something that's small enough to fit in its mouth. So what the leopard frog does, and most frogs do, they actually fill up with air and try to make themselves look too big. And it might croak for me. But leopard frogs get their name because of the spots on their back. So these spots um, for the northern leopard frog, which is what this one is, are always lined with gold. 
So they have this dorsal ridge that usually has gold in it, but all the spots are lined with gold. They're one of the more easy frogs to identify just because they are so distinct. Okay. I hear, you can hear them call. So put me down. So these guys breed usually in later spring. So we're looking at April and May, even into June on occasion. Uh, they breed in large groups. So you're going to basically hear a rocket of frogs. They have a, it's almost like a creaky door call. It's a call. Um, they don't do the rivet. They do a creaky, creepy door. And they'll do it in such large numbers, it literally sounds like you're standing in the middle of highway traffic. It can almost be deafening. So here's our leopard frog. We find them in the water, but we also find them a little bit farther away from water. They tend to be a little bit more adventurous than some of our other frogs. So our American leopard, our northern leopard frog. So we're going to go on a little ride. I have my American bullfrog to show you now. So I'm actually here at the Nature Center, so you get a little virtual tour of our Nature Center. So the American bullfrog is actually a regulated species here in Ohio. Um, if you've ever eaten frog legs, this is the frog that you've probably eaten. They can get up to two pounds. They can jump 12 feet in one leap. And they eat anything and everything that fits in their mouth. That includes other frogs. They're actually highly cannibalistic. We can't house two bullfrogs that are one that's smaller than each other in the same cage. Otherwise, one will disappear because they'll be eaten by the other. So my bullfrog likes to hide. So excuse me while I fish her out of her head. So here's my bullfrog. As you can see, she has much bigger legs than the leopard frog. She is also doing the dramatic fill up with air. But I say she. I actually do know that this is a female. If you look behind her eyes, yes, I know I'm talking about you. If you look behind her eyes, you'll actually see this circle. That circle is her, her tympanic membrane or her tympanum. The females, like this lovely lady here, has an ear <laughs> membrane that is smaller than the eyes, while the male is going to have a, one that is much larger than the eye. So they're pretty easy to identify if you can get a close view of them. Now, the bullfrog is really interesting. They can stay as a tadpole for up to two years, and that is more common the farther north you go. So yeah. We actually see about two years of tadpole length in terms of before they metamorphosize into frogs. Now, they are really good swimmers, but they're the best at leaping. So they have these webbed feet. Their front feet aren't webbed. So they're often found in water that doesn't, isn't ephemeral. It doesn't disappear season to season. It is usually a permanent body of water because they require a more permanent body of water to lay their eggs and to have their tadpole survive. So here's our bullfrog. Our bullfrog is fed worms and mealworms. However, um, frogs are really interesting. They only will eat live food. They require movement to be able to efficiently hunt. And they actually use their eyeballs to help swallow. So if you look at her eyes, she has very large eyes. When she blinks, they actually push down into her throat and help her swallow the food. So imagine trying to eat, you have to blink and use your eyes to help swallow large meals. So interesting nature adaptations. So here's our American bullfrog. So I have one more amphibian to show you before I move on to uh, some animals that have slightly less legs. This is my absolute favorite amphibian. This is the American toad. So our American toad, um, they can actually live up to 30 years in captivity. This toad right here is actually about eight years old. But I actually know this is a boy because if you listen, keep him from peeing all over my laptop, you hear him chirp. Only the males chirp like that. So I know for sure this one's a boy. Now toads also have that thin skin that frogs do, but they lack that slimy mucus layer. They are found more terrestrially. So they're going to be found like in gardens farther away from water than a lot of our frogs would be found. And they use this kind of lumpy, bumpy coloration as camouflage. As you saw, our, our um, 
Bullfrog's huge legs. This guy lacks the ability. He cannot hop or leap 12 feet. He kind of like waddles and jumps, maybe an inch. So they're more of a walker or a crawler rather than a leaper. But they also eat things that fit in their mouth. But because they're not super, super good at evading predation, they rely on camouflage and also poison. This guy is poisonous. So a big distinction that we have here is the difference between poisonous and venomous. Poisonous animals you have to eat or touch to make you sick. Venomous animals have to bite or sting you. So the frog doesn't have teeth. So if it bites me, I just get bitten by a, a toad or a frog. But he does have poison glands. These glands right here actually secrete a toxin, an alkaloid toxin called bufotoxin. And that toxin can cause really upset stomachs. Um, if you've ever had a dog that has caught a toad, you may notice that the mouth is foaming, the dog throws up, that it tastes really bad. It's a really good defense mechanism because if you taste terrible, the next predator is going to completely, uh, that predator is going to completely avo avoid that animal again. So this is our toad. They will breed and lay their eggs in basically a puddle. They are not nearly as selective as the bullfrogs are. They have a quick turnaround from egg to tapple to frog, so they do not require a permanent body of water. But this is my favorite little guy, our American toad. So before we revert to the legless species, I have a legged species. This right here is a species of concern. This is the Eastern box turtle. Box turtles are threatened not only by the pet trade, but by habitat fragmentation. They um, do not travel very far from where they have hatched, their eggs have hatched. So they're very limited on where they can go and how far they can go. And if their habitat is cut and cut and cut, they lose habitat, lose ability to find food, and then also lose ability to properly hibernate in the winter time. Um, box turtles get their name because their shells are hinged. And when they are scared, they can close themselves up in a box. This turtle here is not afraid. <laughs> she just wants me to put her down. Um, so she's not gonna close up, but I do have one that's a little more shy. And you can kind of get an idea how they can close up. Now they can close up completely. So you'll end up just with a hard shell. And that is a really great defense mechanism because their shell is made out of bone. So it's like trying to eat a rock. So you'll all, we often find box turtles in the wild that actually have chew marks on them from coyotes or raccoons or even dogs. But they can't get through, therefore the turtle's able to survive. Box turtles live um, about 50 to 70 years in the wild. So they are a very long-lived species and they require very certain conditions to be able to do well. So here is our Eastern fox turtle. They are omnivores. There are also kind of garbage disposal like with raccoons. They'll eat fruits, they'll eat vegetables, they'll eat uh, frogs, they'll eat insects. Um, and keep in mind, this is the only things that they can catch. So they're not, when they're hungry, they'll move pretty quickly. But again, they're turtles, they're not very fast. However, they, um, they actually are efficient hunters, especially for small insects. And they'll also eat carrion. So they'll eat things that are dead as well. They're very opportunistic. So here is a very unique species, Samami Bay. He's been a little wily, so I'm not gonna take him out too much, but this is a melanistic garter snake. And I don't know if you can see him down on the bottom, he's very dramatic. Um, garter snakes come in a variety of colors. Uh, we're at Lucky here in Northwest Ohio. The melanistic garter snakes are actually about 50% of our population. So melanism is essentially the opposite of albinism. So an animal that is albino is all white. It lacks the melanin production versus a melanistic animal that has way more melanin than normal. So they end up usually being all black. And that all black coloration is really important for the snakes here. Uh, we have a delayed summer, essentially, so our spring slash winter lasts a really long time, and their breeding season is usually about April. So you think of April here in Northwest Ohio, it's still pretty cold, especially if you're in ectotherm and you don't make your own body heat. So they need that black coloration to be able to absorb the sun, to be able to breed and do eat efficiently up here in the north. 
And then we have our normal type garter snake. Who have decided to hide on me, it looks like. They like to hide behind this background. They think they're being sneaky. But as you may notice, I have two snakes, one here and one here. Um, these are some the, one of the species that we are going to see. Let me see if I can get them to come out. Here's one. So this is a normal type garter snake. Now garter snakes don't tend to bite. However, they have a defense mechanism that it's called musking. So it's kind of like they poop and, and create an oil on you. It smells really bad. Um, so it's really good if you have a potential predator because not only do they, they taste like poop and they taste really bad, they will also make the predator smell bad. And so that usually gets the predator to leave them alone. And I'm actually going to feed the garter snakes. So garter snakes in the wild eat small mammals, eat fish, they eat frogs. But here in captivity, they like to eat worms. I'm gonna see if I can get my garter snake to come visit me. They actually are very used to eating. Oh, see if you notice. Oh, one did. So I have two in here. So I don't know if you noticed that garter snake took it straight out of my tongs. Um, they like, they actually hunt by smell. So they don't smell quite like humans do. They're not very good at sharing either. They don't smell like humans do. They actually smell using their tongue. So they taste the air essentially to get their, their food. And so rather than smelling with their nose, they smell with their tongue. So another very interesting snake we have before the big finale snake is a unique snake. You usually find them farther in the northeast. However, this snake has an interesting backstory. It does not want to come out easily. There you are. This is an Eastern milk snake. Now, milk snake seems like a very weird name for a snake. It's actually because they were commonly found in dairy barns. So you're looking, so the, far, the, the farmers used to think that the snakes would come in at night and drink the cow's milk, which wasn't the case. Um, snakes tend to eat small, they eat live prey usually. They like to eat small mammals or even birds. But if you think of a barn, oftentimes in the barn, you'll find things like mice. So the reason why these milk snakes were so common in the dairy barns was because they were there to eat the mice. So they were actually really good to have around in your barns because it kept the mice from eating all the cow's food and pooping everywhere and potentially causing human diseases. Um, they are non-venomous constrictors. So that means if you bit me, I'm just going to get bit by a snake. Nothing's going to happen to me. And they particularly like to eat mice and rats. They only max out about three feet long. They don't get super duper huge. And when they're juveniles, they're actually brightly colored red. So instead of these kind of brownish spots, they have red there. And it's a mimicry. They're trying to pretend that they are a coral snake. So they're trying to, they're trying to think, uh, I'm venomous, leave me alone. But they're actually non-venomous constrictors. So here is our Eastern milk snake. They are actually related to king snakes. And what's really interesting about king snakes is king snakes are immune to rattlesnake and pit viper venom. So that means the king snake can eat a rattlesnake, can get bitten by a rattlesnake, and nothing's going to happen to it. Rattlesnakes actually flee from the smell of king snakes. So milk snakes don't quite have that ability, but they're basically cousins to those snakes as well. So I'm going to show you one of our larger snakes that we have here in Northwest Ohio and actually are unique to this area. And one of my favorite species, this is an Eastern fox snake. These guys max out usually about five feet, then get up to six feet, but they are super cool. They're actually only found in Northwest Ohio 
and a little bit of southeastern Michigan and nowhere else in the world. So they're super unique to this area, especially Mommy Bay. They're fairly common, but unfortunately they kind of have a sorted tail up associated with them. They were often mistaken for copperheads. So if you look at the top of his head, it's kind of coppery colored and they can be highly variable. They can have really bright copper colors or they can have the dark muted ones. But so they were often killed. People thought they were copperheads. And another defense mechanism they have besides fleeing is they'll also, they'll buzz their tail. So if you look at his tail, has no rattle. But what they'll do is they'll vibrate their tail very, very quickly against something hard or in dead grasses or leaves. And it sounds incredibly like a rattlesnake rattle. And it's a mimicry. They're trying to pretend that they're venomous so the potential predator will leave them alone. Unfortunately, with humans, they were killed because they thought they were a venomous species of snake. But the eastern fox snake, completely non-venomous. Non-venomous constrictor, really important to the ecosystem. They eat tons of rats and mice. They'll also eat birds as well. But they are very, very common here in the marsh and in the swampy areas we have back at Mommy Bay State Park. Their breeding season is June. So if you're looking to see one of these snakes come out here in June, you'll often find them hanging out and sunning themselves on lawns or besides the water. So this is our Eastern fox snake. And you can see he's smelling. Today is feeding day. So everybody's a little ornery and they want to eat. And speaking of ornery, I'm going to give you guys a feeding demonstration by one of our very, very exciting Looks like I'm freezing a little bit. There we go. Our very, very exciting animals that we have in my exhibit. They are also regulated by our fishing and hunting licenses. But they eat pretty much anything. So we're going to go on a little bit of adventure. So this is actually, the animal I'm going to show you next is one of the more common animals here at Mommy Bay State Park. They're often found in the, the water. Let's see, tail. So if you see in that corner there, we have a turtle friend. That is a common snapping turtle. They can weigh up to 50 pounds. They cannot pull their head or their legs all the way in their shell. And so what they do to counteract that is they have an incredibly long neck and a very strong bite. Now they can't break a broomstick in half. They cannot shear off your finger. However, their bite can cause stitches. So they are a formidable predator. Uh, they can get very large. Here's an example of a, a full-size adult snapping turtle paw, front, front leg. See these long claws, they almost look like dinosaurs, as well as a shell. This is a medium-sized snapping turtle. This isn't the largest. This turtle here probably is about 25 to 30 pounds. So they get very, very large. And as you can see, my turtle has noticed them here and notice its feeding time. So I'm actually feeding this turtle a chick. All of the food that we buy for our animals, all the frozen uh, mice and birds are humanely euthanized. We don't feed any live for, for our snakes or for our turtle. But I'm going to give you clues. So snapping turtles actually cannot chew their foods. So they're just going to be biting it and trying to swallow it whole. So they don't chew it like we do. So come up to get it. Oh, there he goes. So did you notice you saw that long neck start to come out? Oftentimes, these turtles can actually lay at the bottom of a more shallow river and just stick their head up to breathe. That long, long neck allows it to be able to protect itself from almost all sides. It's really hard to find a good spot to hold a snapping turtle because they can bite you pretty much anywhere. Actually, the most safe spot to hold it is a little intimidating, but you hold it on the right underneath its head on the top part of the carapace. So this front part, the shell part, is called the carapace. And basically, if you have your hand right here, it can't get you because it can't go back all the way. But 
Our snapping turtle is a garbage disposal. So oftentimes if our snakes don't have anything, don't eat their meals, as, especially as we get closer to winter, they get a little bit more picky. They're not super hungry during this time of the year. So if our snake doesn't eat, we actually give the leftovers to our snapping turtle and helps clean up for us. So these are the live animals I have today. Do you guys have any questions? I know I threw a whole bunch of information out at you. And it's okay if you don't. <laughs> Uh, did, did you say that the beaver is a member of the rodent family? The beaver is a member of the rodent family, yes. And are there many of those around this area? There actually, we actually have uh, quite a few more beavers than we normally did um, in previous years. Um, we, we actually see a lot of evidence of beavers around here. I haven't seen one personally at the marsh, but I have seen where beavers have actually chewed around. They love sycamore trees. Um, so we do have beavers definitely here in the park. A really good place to see beavers, um, McGee Marsh, which is a little bit east of us. Also, um, you can see them at some of the metro parks. Side Cut Metro Park also has beaver. And how about the opossum? We had, well, we had one in our backyards uh, some time ago. Yes, okay, I forgot to mention the opossum. So I mentioned that the opossum was my favorite animal. Um, possums are marsupials. So they're kind of a proto mammal, placental mammal, like we see most of our mammals here. Um, so they have their young very, very early, like days rather than months or weeks. And so they're small, completely helpless, and they have that pouch. Possums are unique in the sense that they have an incredibly low body temperature and they are not a vector really for rabies. So they're one of the few mammals that you don't have to worry about getting rabies from. Um, on the flip side of that, they do not live very long. On average, no more than two years. Oh. But what's really neat about the possums, besides not carrying rabies, they love to eat ticks. So not only do they not carry really super uncurable, harmful disease, they eat ticks, which cause disease. So that's why I love my possum friends. Um, they can get themselves into trouble. They can eat things. Um, they can kill chickens. They can eat things, get stuck in garbage cans. They uh, can be very dramatic <laughs> when approached. Um, they look like, they remind me of a giant rat that didn't wake up on the right side of the bed in the morning. They look a little rough. Um, they have the most teeth of any mammal. So it's not something that you really want to pick up and cuddle. However, they're very reluctant to bite. Typically they play dead or they try to flee. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Sandra, I know we haven't been able to hear you, but if you're able to use that chat feature, you can ask any questions through there. Carlton and Janice, any more questions from you? No? Well, All right. Well, thank you so uh, much, I, Lauren, I, for providing. Well, I just wanted to quick, quickly say that about a, week, about a week ago, I was sitting out in front of our house. Point it, Place. It, uh, here in Point Place, and it was around dusk, and this raccoon, just slowly walked right past me, right in front of me, only about a foot away from me, oh, yeah. and walked by me, and then over about 10 more feet, and then turned around and looked at me, and then continued on slowly walking away from me. They are, they are characters. Sometimes they're not very observant. You think because they're only medium sized, they'd be worried about things potentially eating them, but they, they're characters. Just, mm -hmm. just as fearless as could be. I mean, oh, yeah. and, and calmly just walked right by me, and uh, it, was, it was quite a sight. We actually had baby raccoons walk into the nature center last year. The doors were open, it was a beautiful day, and they just strolled on in and we had to shoot them out with uh, broom. So it's bizarre, their behavior. And that, in the springtime, it's normal to see raccoons during the day. A lot of people worry about rabies if you're seeing a raccoon during the day or even a coyote during the day. During breeding season, everything's all wonky. The babies don't sleep well, so the parents don't sleep well. They have to hunt for more food, so they're a lot more active in the daytime. So especially April, May, June, if you're seeing coyotes, raccoon foxes during the day, it's breeding season, it's baby season, they're going to be a little bit more different in schedule, just like humans are. Yeah, last year um, we saw, I don't know if you did, but um, we love Point Place. This is the westernmost point of Lake Erie. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, I was dropping something off at somebody's house here in the point. And somebody was pointing at my, I thought they were pointing at my tire that I had a flat, but no, it was a fox. Oh. And it was walking around like it owned the place. <laughs> and the guy said, oh, can I eat at this, can I feed it this pepperoni? And I, and I started explaining to him why you shouldn't be doing that. 
and then I think it was his grandpa opened up the door. And of course, you know, I, I went up there and I said, oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to take the role of the parent. And he just said, oh, well, maybe he'll listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I went too, because I, yeah. I you know, you know, you don't want to, you know, shame the parents. You know? I know. I know. <laughs> or the great, but I thought that was so funny. It is. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot of what I do here. I am re-educating people. <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> yeah, we've we've seen Fox hanging out at uh, Woodlawn Cemetery. Yes. In, in a that, pack, a pack of them. Yeah. Cemetery is an excellent wildlife spot. They, they've been known to take down a raccoon in a pack. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. our um, Carl's daughter and her husband, they have a, uh, oh, they have land. You could fit a small village in it <laughs> and, and, and a pond, <laughs> a small lake. Well, anyways, the sad thing was they had a German shepherd and um, a pack of coyotes. Yeah. Yeah. Took it down. That is something yeah. they can carry out. But they, um, I guess you said the, the coyote, individual coyotes don't weigh more than 30, 35, 30, 40 pounds. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. But I guess in a, in a pack, they can just do an yeah. incredible. They can have some. Yeah. We, we, live near, we live near Manhattan Marsh, and there's going to be a new Metro Park. Uh, yeah, opening soon. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. Yeah, but uh, we we've seen coyote. Yeah, we've seen coyote. And, uh, yeah, deer deer come over into the back of our property sometimes, and they have to go through a residential area. Yeah, about, we can't about, figure uh, it out. Half a mile or the so. The neighbors, the neighbors feed them. Yeah, yeah. it's really funny. We got neighbors. Uh, I want to make a long story short. Uh, the school owns the property. They never sold the school, and now it's a b baseball field. Um, so, so the geese love it because it's short oh. manicured grass and they go, oh, for us? <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So, so some, some of the neighbors feed the goose and the deer and some don't, but um, if they have guns, at least they keep them at home. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, several years ago, several years ago when we walked the boardwalk out there at Maumee Bay State Park, we saw deer. Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 Uh, this year has been a little bit different. The water has been so high for oh yeah yeah, yeah. that we don't have as many deer back there. However, if you drive down by the beach or by the campground at dusk, my yeah. record is 49 deer in one one spot. There, I, I just look one spot yeah. ahead of me, and there are 49 deer in a herd. So yeah. we have deer here, that's for sure. Oh, our our deer <laughs> our deer are so smart here at Side Cut that they look both ways before they cross the road. Yes, yes, it's funny <laughs> how they get used to <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, All right. You. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren, for being here. We really appreciate you providing this program for us. Not a problem. And please okay. let me know if you're interested in anything else. Um, I do have a coworker who does lighthouse talks. So if you're interested. Oh, okay. that'd be nice. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. It's recording.